Great. So good morning, good afternoon, everyone, wherever in the world uh, you are. Welcome to this uh, joint event uh, organized together with the World Health Organization Regional Office Europe, Pan American Health Organization, Movement the International, and NCD Alliance. And today we are going to talk then about lessons for alcohol policy from the coronavirus crisis. And we could see uh, during now more than a year that the coronavirus uh, crisis has really brought into our attention or, or put focus on the alcohol harm and the burden it causes on our health systems and on also on our societies. And we could also see uh, the impact of evidence-based uh, alcohol policies on on health of people and on promotion of health and, and prevention uh, of harm and during the this time we could see uh, the the recommendations from who uh, and assistance for the member states uh, how to deal then with with alcohol to prevent more harm during this crisis and there were several reports important reports published yeah, during this period of time looking at different uh, aspects uh, of alcohol harm and the commercial determinants uh, of, of health. So today we have like 90 minutes <laughs> to, to go through all these things that I have uh, just summarized. And we have a great line of speakers. And um, um, yeah, I should actually introduce myself. My name is Kristina Sperkova. I'm, I'm president of Movendi International, and I have the honor to to moderate uh, today's webinar. And uh, before we invite our speakers who are here uh, present, and I will introduce them before they speak, uh, I will we will play a video with uh, with uh, remarks from from the from Dr. Anselm Hennis, who is the director of uh, NCDs and mental health in Pan American Health Organization. So I would like to ask uh, for the video, please. And we don't hear it yet. Thank you all for taking the time to join us today. My name is Anselm Hennis. I'm the Director of non Capital Disease and Mental Health at the Pan American Health Organization. And it is indeed an honor to have the opportunity to take part in this side event as member states discuss and deliberate on the way forward for better health for all. As you will all be aware, the harmful use of alcohol is a significant problem globally and in the region of the Americas. This region has the lowest level of abstention in the world and the second highest average of alcohol per capita consumption after the European region. The region of the Americas has also been particularly hard hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. As of May 14th, the region of the Americas has reported over 64 million cases of COVID-19, representing 40% of all cases reported globally. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a significant impact on alcohol use, service provision, policy, and research. During the pandemic and the lockdowns which followed, alcohol consumption moved from being a public activity to being an activity within our The sound disappeared. Mike, I think you will need to pause it. Was it go back a little bit?
No sound. Which followed. Alcohol consumption moved from being a public activity to being an activity within our family homes. Alcohol has been used to cope with anxiety, depression, and other stressors due to quarantines and lockdowns. There are a wide range of experiences within the region of the Americas. Some countries have reported an increase in alcohol consumption, while others have reported a decrease. In some countries, alcohol policies have been loosened. Online and social media marketing of alcohol increased exponentially as a result. Home delivery and internet sales have soared. Licit alcohol consumption increased, and these have been associated fatalities in a number of countries. As we plan and implement recovery efforts made to bring us towards a new normal, effective alcohol policies are now more at risk than ever. This means that public health is also at risk. The way forward needs more equitable and sustainable. We must work to protect alcohol policies which are proven to be effective and promote the development of these policies in the protection of public health interests where they're not currently in place. I hope the experiences that are shared today will inspire us all to work better together and towards a safer world. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mike, for playing the video. And uh, thank you, Dr. Hennis, for the introductory remarks. And I would actually smoothly transition to a uh, presentation of Maristella, who is the senior advisor on, um, on uh, alcohol and substance abuse uh, in Pan uh, American Health Organization. So welcome, Maristella. I believe that you will elaborate on the information that we have just heard in the video. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, just... Uh, uh, an, a note for all participants, if there is still uh, any question about it, we have interpretation and there is a small globe at the bottom of the screen. And if you press, you're going to see the options for Spanish or English. Uh, so let me uh, put my presentation. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for this invitation. It's an honor to me to be addressing all of you participating in this joint event. Uh, I also thank uh, Jacqueline uh, McDiarmid who helped me uh, prepare this presentation. So uh, Briefly speaking about the situation in the Americas related to alcohol uh, consumption and harms, uh, pre-COVID, uh, we know the Americas has the second highest average per capita consumption uh, after the European region and is also well above the global average uh, in consumption. Uh, we also have the lowest level of abstention in the world in 2016, the last time that we had information uh, from WHO, 46.1% of the adult population uh, uh, drank in the past year. And uh, in terms of heavy episodic drinking, those who drink five or more drinks on occasion uh, once a month, about 25% of the general population drinks that way. And that is not counting uh, just drinkers, it's of, of overall population. When you count only drinkers, among males is above uh, 50% or close to 50% uh, who drinks that way. Uh, 
And we also have the highest prevalence of alcohol use disorders, meaning alcohol dependence and harmful use of alcohol, according to the ICD, for women. And the second uh, uh, highest prevalence in the world after Europe for men. And so this consumption and uh, these problems have uh, led in 2016 to uh, 379 deaths in the Americas, at least, representing 5.5% of all uh, the deaths for all causes in the region, and over 18 million, almost 90 million uh, deaths or disability life-adjusted years lost, uh, representing even more 6.7% of all deaths in the region. And uh, you can see that alcohol is a risk factor for seven of the eight leading causes of death in the region among young people uh, from 15 to 49 years of age. And this is why the impact, the disability is so high, because people uh, die young and there are many lives lost or years of productivity lost. The situation in terms of alcohol policies is uh, not uh, very nice, and, uh, and uh, there is a lot of room for improvement. We have uh, eight countries that have a national alcohol policy, but uh, two countries with subnational policies, and uh, the majority of countries do not yet have a written alcohol policy policy as of 2016. And we used a, a score system that was actually developed in the European office and we adapted using the responses of member states to the global survey on alcohol and health and to analyze the policies for uh, that are enshrined, uh, exist in the global alcohol strategy, the 10 areas of action. And in circle, I put the three areas that represent the best buys. And uh, the score can go up to uh, 100 points. And here is the average uh, in the countries of the region. As you can see, the average in general is relatively low with a lot of variance. And the lowest average scores uh, were actually in, in, actually in the three best buys uh, areas of policy. <clears throat> And as you know, uh, WHO uh, launched in 2018 uh, an initiative called SAFER that uh, includes the five uh, most cost-effective uh, in interventions that can be used uh, and uh, to stimulate country action. And includes the three best buys plus uh, drink driving policies and uh, services in primary care, such as screening and brief interventions. And you can see in the left side of the screen that uh, we have a very low rate of countries that uh, are implementing those uh, five policies. So with the alcohol and uh, the pandemic and uh, that was the first thing what we did notice. The first thing was the spread of misinformation that uh, said that alcohol could protect against the virus. Alcoholic people with alcohol dependence would not get the virus. It could, <clears throat> they wouldn't be infected, uh, and it would actually stimulate the immune system, and which are all uh, not true. So we. Uh, first uh, alert uh, to the situation in editorials in scientific journals and uh, published, uh, produced together with the European office as well, fact sheets and information to the public on the, uh, the risks of alcohol in general and also in combination uh, with a pandemic and uh, the risk of getting infected and infecting others, uh, in addition to the known risks of drinking alcohol and drinking at home. Uh, we also did uh, 
dozens actually of webinars in English, Spanish, Portuguese, Facebook live sessions with country offices at global level to try to increase awareness of the problem uh, in the region and worldwide. And we also uh, uh, launched a survey, a regional online survey, the same uh, questionnaire for uh, all countries in Latin America and the Caribbean in 33 countries uh, in the spring of 2020 that for about a little less than a month, uh, uh, participants could uh, complete uh, the survey in an anonymous way. And uh, we obtained uh, over 12,000 responses and ask, we asked questions about uh, demographics, uh, the, the measures taken by people uh, during COVID, uh, following the quarantines or not, and, uh, and their alcohol consumption before and during the pandemic. We also ask about their mental health uh, uh, feelings, uh, so to say, or the impact on their mental health in the last 14 days. And these are a very over, uh, brief overall uh, presentation of the results that we got. In terms of average consumption, there was a, a, a frequency of consumption has decreased, uh, as you can see from uh, the total of 76% drinking in 2019 to 63%. So there was a, a decrease in both men and women, even though these averages, <coughs> sorry, this frequency is above what uh, we see in uh, other uh, assessments that we have done. So we know that the survey is not really representative of the population in the region, only of the respondents. And uh, there was also a trend towards the consumption of stronger uh, alcohol beverages, uh, moving uh, from uh, beer, for example, to more wine, more spirits, and also an increase in illicit or informal alcohol consumption. And uh, actually, this has led to uh, hundreds of deaths in the region due to contaminated alcohol uh, with methanol or heavy metals. And uh, the survey also asked about uh, seeking care to reduce their alcohol consumption and the overwhelming majority, above 90%, uh, did not seek help either before or during the pandemic, indicating the big gap that we have in access and uh, availability and uh, interest in treatment services. In a heavy episodic drinking, uh, we also saw a decrease, but what it's important here uh, to mention is that uh, about a, th a third of the, ter uh, the population of the respondents were still uh, reporting such uh, uh, behavior during the pandemic. Oops. I don't know why this is happening. Uh, and uh, uh, a man, 43% uh, actually uh, doing that uh, type of consumption. And which is very worrisome because we know this is the most uh, uh, risky uh, consumption that can lead to several other problems. The change, uh, uh, we also analyze a change in heavy episodic drinking from 2019 to 2020. As you can see, uh, about a third decreased that they had that uh, um, pattern in 2019 and they uh, decreased for 2020. But you have uh, about uh, 11 to 13 percent that increase the frequency of their uh, heavy episodic drinking. And most of all, that uh, about 60 percent did not change at all. But that means that they 
were drinking like that in 2019 and continue to drink at least once a month uh, in their pattern in high uh, drinking occasions. Heavy episodic drinking was also more prevalent in higher income groups. They were more uh, prevalent among those uh, 18 to 39 years of age, and always males had more uh, heavy episodic drinking than uh, women. And this pattern was also associated with more negative mental health feelings, such as anxiety, and with the amount of quarantine measures, measures uh, used. The impact of COVID on alcohol uh, use, harms, and policy is still not very well known, and this is a plea to uh, to do these evaluations, we need to assess uh, at local level, country level, to the extent possible, how the harms uh, decreased or increased, and what type of harms, and what the uh, what policies uh, have changed and contributed to that. So we could have an increase in consumption factors such as anxiety, stress, boredom, or increasing free time, multitasking, or online marketing. There are many reasons for an increase in consumption, uh, online alcohol promotion, but also there were uh, factors related to a possible decrease in consumption, such as reduction in availability, bars and restaurants were closed, for example, and in affordability, people had uh, hardships, and the public drinking uh, because of venues were closed, sports events didn't happen, also were reduced. But uh, we just saw uh, information from Brazil, uh, uh, for example, that actually there was an increase in 5% above 2019 in the sales of alcohol, in the uh, volume of alcohol sold, uh, in 2020, uh, and that was an increase not seen since 2014. So uh, this indicates uh, a, a picture that is different from this early study that we have done, and it is very worrisome. Uh, what are the, uh, the issues that we need to be looking at uh, on alcohol policy looking forward. First, the online sales, delivery uh, of alcohol uh, have uh, scaled up tremendously and they may continue as, uh, as a new normal and that uh, undermines uh, the purpose of alcohol policy in reducing alcohol availability. Uh, to decrease the harm. We need to keep the current policies and not go backwards. And we also need to step up training of professionals and availability of services, be them online or in person, uh, because uh, there is a great need for that and a, a big gap uh, that uh, got worse with the pandemic. And also the info, you know, health literacy is very important as well, not only the misinformation, uh, but uh, people have interest in knowing what are the harms related to, to alcohol. So I finished my presentation with my five P's that we need to get prepared for the next pandemic or emergency uh, with the alcohol policy directives, prevent harm, protect the public, promote health, and participate uh, all in, in uh, promoting alcohol policies. Thank you very much. Sorry for this. <laughs> line thank on the you. screen that I don't know where it comes from. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Maristela. Yeah, these are the challenges of these online meetings and platforms yeah. that was a whiteboard that was on and most probably someone used the mouse yeah. and then we got this beautiful red line through. <laughs> but yeah, you follow the red line, so that's great. <laughs> now, thank you very much for the presentation. Also, uh, in between, like 
if everyone can stay muted, please do so and uh, do not try many buttons because it's a bit uh, disturbing. Uh, but yeah, this is the usual challenge of the Zoom meetings. Uh, and also I would like to inform everyone that we will have a discussion after all the presenters have uh, had their presentation. So if you have questions, please write them in the chat. You can actually write your question or like typing with writing question in capital so we can easier identify it uh, out from uh, in the in the noise of uh, comments about the low quality of sound and such so it will help us a lot uh, and um, now we uh, ne the next one on on the list should be actually um, Karina Ferreira Borges but uh, as WHA is going all on also uh, we have some problems. So we will jump to the next presenter, and that will be uh, Per Leymar, who is an um, alcohol policy advisor from IOGT NTO in Sweden. And then we will invite uh, Karina's colleague uh, to speak on the European situation. So Per will first present the global situation, which is a result of a report that uh, the group of uh, international group of uh, well-known researchers have uh, written and it was released in January 2021. So, Per, I will give you the floor now. And as I said, everyone can write questions in the chat and then we will attend them later on. Okay, thank you, Christina. Thanks for inviting me. Um, as Christina said, I'm Palema, working for IDG NTO in Sweden, uh, which is a Swedish voluntary organization working with alcohol and issues around alcohol and uh, narcotics and policies. Um, I'm, I'll try to share my screen. Uh, um, that will work. Tells me. Yeah, it seems good. Um, so I'm here to, to talk about the report, as Christina said, that was published earlier this year um, about the role of alcohol in the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, the report is uh, written by an independent group of researchers, uh, as you can see here on the on the screen. Uh, two of the researchers are from Sweden, from uh, Adaira and San Andreas. Uh, we have one from Australia, Tennessee, the Seas in the group. Uh, and three researchers from basically in Canada, Timothy Laney, Adam Shirk, and Tim Stockholm, and then Harold Holder, who uh, is living in, in the United States. Um, this report on the coronavirus is actually the, uh, a part of a series, and it's the eighth report in, in a series of uh, written by, by this group. Uh, on alcohol in different aspects. Um, earlier reports have been about things like alcohol in pregnancy, violence, cancer, and uh, the science around uh, effects of low dose alcohol, for instance. Uh, these reports are available, I think, on the Movendi uh, website uh, as PDFs in English. So, um, the reports that are initiated by, by 14 academic and voluntary organizations in the Nordic countries, uh, and you can see their logos on the screen. Uh, so, this, re this year's report on, on the coronavirus, uh, the group has looked at uh, early research into 
control well for immunity and infections, as well as uh, the uh, impact of alcohol on uh, behavioral effects, as we will know. Uh, and when you look at what has been sort of known from, from reports in media and so on, on policy developments and, and effects around the world. So if we look at uh, alcohol and immune system, uh, at first it is sort of well known that, that uh, alcohol affects the immune system and weakens the immune system. Uh, in, in different ways, and especially uh, relevant for the COVID-19 pandemic is that uh, uh, alcohol increases a receptor that the coronavirus uh, sort of attaches itself to to, to enter the, the human cell. Uh, these receptors are called the ACE2 receptors. Um, per, can I please uh, interrupt a little bit because yeah. the quality of your sound is really low. So you would need to really speak very loud, most probably. Okay. I'll try to, to speak louder then. <laughs> yeah, this is much better. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, yes, we. we uh, alcohol increases the, the uh, number of these ACE2 receptors uh, on the human cells, so it gives the coronavirus more entry points into the cells and then thereby uh, risk increasing the, uh, the, the, the illness or the severity of the illness. But alcohol also influences uh, Sort of the other parts of the immune system, uh, and for instance, the adaptive part of the immune system where alcohol well, inhibits uh, the, the, uh, the functioning of, of these cells as well as the production of antibodies. Uh, so, alcohol has several effects on, on the immune system, which but it was one aspect of its role uh, in, in the COVID pandemic. But alcohol also has, as we know, uh, several behavioral effects that has played in, in this pandemic. Um, and especially in, in the combination with, with these effects on the immune system. Now, we know that alcohol reduces inhibition uh, impairs judgment, uh, even uh, in, in uh, at low levels of consumption, and um, this leads to well, reduced capacity or, or uh, to, to give attention to social distancing and, and, and sort of to to control your behavior in this new and. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, unknown uh, state uh, that, that this pandemic has, has brought. And this has been this has been shown to have a, a, a large effect in, in different alcohol what we call, the report calls alcohol centric social context where uh, Alcohol normally is, is consumed, like in, in restaurants and bars or parties, where there have been several uh, reports on, on super spreader events in, in those circumstances. And we have seen many areas, regions around the, the world, where uh, authorities have closed down bars or restaurants because of, of uh, the spread and increase of, of spread of, of infection of the virus. Uh, so, but this then uh, 
influence is, of course, healthcare. Uh, to start with alcohol outside of any pandemic has a considerable burden on, on healthcare uh, uh, as it is. But as, as it's in alcohol increases in transmission and the severity of, of the disease, it gives an added burden uh, on, on healthcare during this pandemic in a situation where we, we need all the resources we can manage uh, to, to take care of, of, of the pandemic. Uh, so, to reduce alcohol consumption uh, and the risks of alcohol in the pandemic, uh, as I can show in this pandemic, this uh, would help uh, healthcare and release or sort of lessen the, the burden, which is great as it is. Uh, uh, and improve the possibilities to actually uh, take care of the patients uh, needed in this situation. And looking, the report looks at only three countries. Uh, uh, in this case, uh, to see that actually the sort of the hospitalizations from alcohol uh, in, a, in a normal year, an ordinary year with no pandemic, is actually greater than the, the number of COVID-19 hospitalizations during last year. Uh, and the countries in court looks at for this is uh, only Canada, Finland, and Sweden, where, where data was available for at the time. Where the report was, was written. So we've been looking at government responses over the world. The report uh, has a description from different parts of the world, and I always sort of just talk about them generally. Um, in some countries, as we know, alcohol has been banned completely uh, for periods of time uh, of different lengths. I think South Africa is perhaps the most well known, but alcohol bans have been used in several countries uh, around the world. Uh, in some countries, uh, alcohol is declared as an essential product, especially uh, this is applicable in the countries where you have lockdowns uh, and sort of many companies, many uh, sort of sections of the economy are locked down uh, and only essential uh, sectors are allowed to, to be open and, and continue. Mm. And in a couple of those situations, alcohol has been declared as essential, that is, uh, the alcohol sales and alcohol productions are allowed to stay open while other parts of, of the economy has been closed down. The most common policy response from, from governments uh, seems to have been to limit or ban on trade sale, that is, so the serving of alcohol in, in restaurants and bars because of, of the role of, of transmission of the disease in, in those circumstances. Um, and another trend is that where in, in areas or, or countries where it hasn't been allowed uh, Governments had allowed internet sales and home deliveries either from stores or from restaurants, so either from off trade or, or on trade establishments. 
So generally, governments have, have reacted in, a, uh, in different ways, either restricting or, or uh, loosening uh, regulations uh, in this period. The report states a few recommendations for governments uh, and based on, on, on these, these findings in the report, the, the authors recommend governments to sustain or and strengthen established after regulations. Uh, and this is of course important in, in uh, any situation, but especially during a pandemic where you have a high burden on, on, on healthcare system and you have a burden on the economy. This is, uh, of course, extra, uh, of extra importance to, to strengthen the alcohol quality regulations to, to lower the harm and, and lower the burden on, on society. So it's, um, can I please ask you to speed up and uh, also again speak up? <laughs> you have like okay. one minute. <laughs> Thank you. But obviously not around, around the world. Uh, <laughs> so, strengthening alcohol policies whenever possible could reduce alcohol consumption, as we were related to. This is especially important during the pandemic. Conclusion from the report is that alcohol consumption has played a crucial role uh, during the pandemic for transmission and propagation. And the temporary policy changes where you have allowed uh, things that were not allowed before should be reversed after the, the pandemic. So you, to avoid a, a, a Last in a negative uh, legacy of the pandemic of public health. And the report ends with uh, decision makers should consider the total impact of alcohol consumption across different uh, economic and social areas rather than looking at the interest on a selected sector, in this case the alcohol sector. Uh, and the report from OECD that was published last year, that, or last week, that we will hear a bit later, shows this uh, very clearly uh, when it models the effects of alcohol on, on the economy uh, and shows that for the OECD countries, almost 2% of GDP is reduced by alcohol consumption and, and the harms alcohol consumption contains. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Per. So uh, it was a bit of a challenge to hear everything that you are saying, uh, but I believe that also other speakers will actually underline or elaborate on what you have been also presenting. As you said, we will also hear uh, some of it from the OECD report. And now we will talk a little bit more about the harm and what has been done in the European region. So uh, I will now give the floor to uh, Maria Neufeld, who will replace uh, then Karina uh, ferreira Borges, And uh, Maria is her colleague from WHO European Office for Prevention of and Control of Non-Communicable Diseases. So Maria, welcome. Thank you for being so um, flexible. And um, the floor is yours. Thank you. I hope you can hear me well. Um, I apologize. Uh, Karina had an emergency and asked me to step up and to um, present on her behalf. So uh, 
for some reason I cannot switch back to my first slide, but it doesn't matter. So uh, thank you again uh, for, uh, it's really a great honor uh, to be here with you today and to present on behalf of WHO Euro. And um, just to say that we are, um, although we are the regional office or we belong to the regional office, we're actually based in Moscow. We are the, the European office for the prevention and control of NCDs. And uh, just to frame that a bit, um, we are um, we're working, uh, so we are the program for alcohol and illicit drugs. Um, and at the same time, uh, Karina, who is the program manager for that, she's also the head of the office. And the of office as such is working on uh, NCD risk factors, so non-communicable disease risk factors, prevention and the prevention thereof. So, and I think that's really important to emphasize to say that we're really working closely with colleagues from tobacco control, uh, which is very inspiring, I think, and also uh, uh, with colleagues from nutrition, obesity, and physical activity. And it's really our vision to, um, to look at all these uh, things together and to make sure that people can live longer and healthier lives. And uh, for us, it's absolutely clear that alcohol is simply not part of, of a healthy lifestyle. Uh, so now I hope I can, yes. So, um, and I mean, needless to say, um, how uh, cross the cross-cutting impact of alcohol, still, I really like like, all the presentations I do, I really like to go back to the basics and really emphasize uh, reducing alcohol consumption. It's not just about health. It's an overarching um, thing that will affect most of the SDGs. So 14 out of 17 as SDGs. Um, there's also uh, incredibly um, impressively uh, um, shown by also by uh, Movendi International uh, 14 of 17 goals are actually um, affected by alcohol. So um, I think it's just important to, to keep that in mind. We're, we're talking not just about uh, health as such. So uh, if we look at, uh, at the WHO European region, unfortunately, we, um, we, have <laughs> we are the world's champions in alcohol per capita consumption. So those are data for 2016. We have new data, meanwhile. Um, they are not very um, encouraging. So in 2016, uh, we as a region have consumed 9.8 liters per, per capita. Um, so those are those who are 15 years and older. In 2019, it's 9.5. Uh, and uh, here uh, on that slide, you see the regional distribution of uh, total alcohol per capita consumption in drinkers only. So those who have consumed alcohol in the past 12 months and we're seeing like it's, um, it's really quite a lot. And um, another thing I also very important. So basically drinkers in our region drink a lot. There are also countries where we have high abstain, uh, abstainer rates, but those who drink, they drink a lot. So alcohol consumption is concentrated in a few individuals uh, who also suffer the harm. And uh, in, uh, in a lot of countries of the region, uh, heavy episodic drinking is quite prevalent and it creates specific uh, challenges and problems also within the health systems. Um, and uh, yeah, I apologize for, for the noise. Um, and also just to say uh, in, in our region, well, we have countries with very low uh, drinking levels, but then we have, unfortunately, the world champions in, in, in drinking uh, um, in uh, alcohol per capita consumption. So it's, it creates specific challenges for, for us. So if we look at the alcohol attributable bur burden, um, I think those, uh, <laughs> This is not really new. So from the approximately 3 million death, alcohol attributable death that we have in the world, 1 million uh, occurs in our region. And I think here uh, it's a bit blurry that one graph on the right hand side. But just to say that um, uh, one of the biggest challenges is also that a lot of those deaths, they appear early in life. So different than, for instance, tobacco. Um, alcohol is a killer that kills early on um, and affects uh, young people. If 
future generations and so forth. So this is sort of <laughs> just an introduction. I always find very important to um, sort of frame it like that and say like, well, Alco is really an accelerator of um, also of um, socioeconomic and other inequalities. And this is, I think, what we've been also seeing and experiencing over the past year. So, um, and we, we think back of the very beginning of the pandemic, I think at the, at the beginning, there was that overall uncertainty uh, at the early stage, and we really saw a spike in misinformation. So there were a lot of myth uh, circulating, um, and I've seen that in various languages, uh, actually in various uh, uh, outlets. So things like alcohol kills the virus, uh, and there were really people who believed that when they were th when they would drink alcohol, that they would you know s somehow disinfect uh, their body from from within. <clears throat> and um, uh, I think everyone is also familiar with the uh, with that, that story, uh, sadly, of the mass methanol poisonings that has occurred in Iran, where people were also drinking alcohol, believing that it would kill the virus. Uh, sadly, those things, they happen not just in Iran, they also happened in uh, our region. They happened in, um, for instance, um, the reports uh, from that, um, I think, from Turkey and um, Azerbaijan, Armenia, um, and those stories that were also associated with um, with that fear uh, from the virus and that belief that if people would consume alcohol, that they would, you know, um, uh, decrease the risk um, of getting infected. Uh, and uh, again, in terms of that relative uncertainly of, of that high uncertainty at the beginning. I think there was also a kind of uncertainty in terms of how to regulate alcohol, what that means now, what does the new normal, the, the lockdowns and, and so forth, how to handle that. And I think we already heard uh, a, a lot about that. But just to say that in our region, we also saw that diversity. So for instance, some countries, they declared alcohol to be an essential good and the provision of Online, uh, online sales of alcohol and delivery services as an essential service. There were actually countries that uh, relaxed the alcohol control legislation and they allowed... Can um, it, can it, can it, can it. Sorry. <laughs> so, and they allowed the sales of alcohol online. And uh, some other countries, uh, they introduced... Uh, actual availability restrictions, uh, temporary or uh, sometimes um, only within um, certain regions. But there were sort of different ways of approaching that. And I think like this really reflects that also diversity in a way of how alcohol is understood and uh, regulated in, in, in our region, because again, it's a very diverse region. So this is just you know, um, just a slide uh, demonstrating that um, misinformation and um, we, we've, been, we've been actually trying to uh, to look into that more systematically. Um, and um, again, so the, the Smith and the, uh, and the, the false beliefs, um, they were really, a uh, really big problem at the beginning. And this is actually uh, why we, uh, the way we responded to that, we did um, a fact sheet together with our colleagues from PAHO um, and uh, from EMRO and also from um, HQ. And for me, I think like this was one of the best uh, projects, to be honest, or experiences I had while working um, on on um, on that topic, or maybe in double <laughs> in general, because I think like this is very symbolic that uh, in response to that really uncertainly, uh, we really pulled our resources together and we reacted very quickly and we did something that was very simple, uh, addressing the general public and really um, bringing across those messages, saying like, no, alcohol will not protect you from the virus. And uh, the only thing you can use it for 
is for, um, well, <laughs> disinfecting your hands. Um, and it was a really nice experience because I think, like, again, we have worked with different regions and, and also with collaborating um, centers. And we have uh, produced that in Arabic, English, Spanish, Portuguese, and Russian. Um, and um, the nice thing about it was picked up and was translated in many, many other uh, languages. Uh, we have produced um, an infographic, also again, targeting the, the general public, very easy messaging, really saying, you know, basic things like, uh, you know, like this is sort of not the time to drink and you should uh, avoid alcohol altogether because like it has negative impact um, on the immune system. It changes your behavior um, and so forth. Um, we have also issued uh, an, an FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions uh, Guide, that was more targeting the policymakers because we really wanted also to bring our messages across to the decision makers and really support them and in making, <laughs> let's say, the right decision. Uh, we really wanted to give them the information, to give them the evidence and really um, uh, communicate that... Uh, during lockdowns, the last thing we need is loosening the legislation of alcohol control policies so people can drink alone at home in isolation. So, for instance, all the things Maristella was also talking about, and Maristella was also part of this project. Um, the good or the nice thing about it, again, that this was also then picked up by countries and translated and adapted to the local context. And I think it was really nice um, after the first uh, wave, when um, the measures were loosened again and, uh, and uh, the lockdowns were um, uh, eased, so, or um, when people could, you know, like again go out, there were there were those um, public uh, public or messages or materials really uh, telling people that uh, they might want consider, reconsider their consumption because of the also of the behavioral risk, because of social, um, physical distancing and people when they're intoxicated that they um, are not likely to keep it and so forth. So I think this was a good timing back then. Back then. Uh, and for us, I think it was uh, <clears throat> retrospectively reflecting on that. I think for us, this was also a moment where we could really we tried really to uh, use the seize the opportunity and to message um, um, and, and to have the dialogue on the best bias again. And obviously, availability and the way we regulate availability, whether we increase, uh, we introduce um, restrictions and so forth, that was probably the most important area. But as such, I think there was also that momentum and I mean, still is, right? Uh, in terms of really saying that alcohol, it has this cross-cutting uh, negative impact on people's lives and whole societies. So the, the, the first <laughs> slide I was showing in terms of uh, the negative impact of SDGs. And I think there is, it's still a momentum uh, there and still an opportunity. And so we, uh, so I'm really happy to, to see that um, the work um, uh, is is uh, still going on here. Um, so um, yeah, I think I'll I'll just skip that because I actually already said um, in in um, in, in uh, the content of the other slides. So it started more as fighting fake news and uh, mis misinformation, but again, it was more about for us. It was more about communicating the best buys and other um, policies especially also the provision of uh, uh, screen brief intervention and treatment and so forth during the lockdowns, because we know that there were some disruptions of that, and this is something very serious and a whole, and the whole another topic. Um, just some um, brief uh, reflections on the receptions of the materials developed. Um, again, I think um, I'm very happy to, uh, I am, and I was very happy to see that 
uh, we were really, that we received attention, that WHO was heard and listened to, because a lot of countries were, um, I mean, I'm not the one to say whether we were successful or not on, on, on fighting the misinformation, but it was really nice to see um, that global media outlets were picking up the right messaging and really saying that um, drinking is increasing or, or may increase the risks uh, and uh, that people uh, are not um, are not supposed to drink during the crisis. <laughs> this is just one, it was very funny, it's just one of the screen uh, capture of the uh, late night show, Stephen Colbert. I mean, I don't watch it personally, but it was really funny that, you know, the like colleagues and friends, they were all of a sudden messaging me and saying, like, look, like even the U.S. media are picking up things that we produced. Uh, so there are, you know, here uh, we see some CNN and CNBC um, news items uh, on, on that, picking that up. So we receive like really broad international attention. Sometimes questionable, but well. Uh, and uh, another, again, another good thing was that countries really took um, those materials and developed based on that mess on those messages, on those ideas, developed their own, like tailored to the context and their local. Uh, languages and, and appropriate to their own context. So here we see um, uh, the, the Russian Consumer Protection and Welfare Service uh, in, in Russia, where they basically uh, took those and reworked it a bit and, um, um, well, and, and then released that infographic in their own style. And uh, I think it was very nice. Um, so, um, I mean, those are those are the things that we did at the very beginning. And in terms of like what what is it that we have been doing in WHO Europe that one last year, I just want to show that uh, one um, uh, collaboration, a collaborative project. It is uh, led by um, also if you the, just speed up, Maria. So because yeah, yeah, yeah. if you can wrap up, please. Yeah, this is this is the last slide actually. Um, so just to say that this is this is the monitoring um, survey, uh, pan-European survey that has now covered actually not just Western European countries but also countries of Eastern Europe uh, and Central Asia. And I think here further monitoring is key because what uh, what we have been seeing in, in that survey. That is also, it seems like that overall consumption has declined, declined during the lockdowns. It seems not to be uniformly across all groups. So, for instance, what we see, especially in the one survey that we now did for, for the eastern part of the region, young people seem to drink more during the pandemic, women heavy drinkers. So they all self-report increases in their consumption. And it seems like although alcohol per capita consumption might at such decline, we might see uh, an increasing proportion of heavy drinkers. So this is really worrisome. This really tells us that people, you know, more vulnerable people uh, might experience the, the most harm, um, again, from uh, that pandemic, so which is really an accelerator. Here we produced, um, I mean, I will not talk about that anymore. This is just to say that that this is a very toxic cocktail. NCDs uh, as the preconditions that people have, and then COVID on top of that, and uh, those NCDs, non-communicable diseases, we know that alcohol is a big risk factor for that. So just to say that, we're taking that very seriously, and our, our regional director is very committed to that. Um, and um, well, again, further monitoring is key. And what worries us is the uh, are the increasing inequalities and the vulnerabilities of certain risks uh, of certain groups of people. Thank you so much, Christina and Mike and uh, everyone else. And um, I'm here for. Um, any follow-up questions and the discussion. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you very much, Maria. And I think it was interesting to compare this. The, the beginning was very similar to Pao, like about all the myths and, uh, and the, that were spread. So they were actually very global, we could see. And uh, then thank you. And as you said, you have a, had a good experience of really joint efforts then with other regional offices and the headquarters to address the issue. And we were very thankful that, uh, that this message came then from WHO. Um, and as you're saying, the monitoring is important. And that takes us also to monitoring of uh, the of the alcohol industry and what has been happening during the pandemic, because we have uh, seen several activities that NCD Alliance together with Spectrum documented very well. So I will give the floor to, uh, to Lucy, who is the advocacy and campaign manager in NCD Alliance, and uh, tell us a little bit more about the industry. So the floor is yours to see. Thank you so much. And I'm just going to pull up my slides, if that's okay. Uh, sorry, it always takes a moment to do this, doesn't it? Um, really lovely to be with you all today. And I'll try not to speak too long um, because a lot of the things that I was going to cover are going to have already been touched on. So I'm going to sort of whiz through a little bit. Um, so yeah, from the NCD Alliance, and we've um, we've been around for since around 2009, and we've certainly found um, that the chronic neglect of NCDs over the many decades has contributed to what is still the leading cause of death and disability in the world, um, and. A lot of those deaths, a lot of that illness is avoidable. So the NCD Alliance came together around uh, similar risk factors for sort of similar diseases, I suppose, um, that aren't contagious from one person to another, but have um, social, uh, commercial, um, modifiable risk factors, as well as systems problems and challenges that we need to work on together to have a solution to help people be healthier. Certainly what we found with the pandemic, though, was that uh, NCDs and COVID-19 is, is a deadly collision. Um, and the insufficient progress and the underinvestment in healthy populations and prevention in particular um, and in weak and inadequate health systems has sort of collided to cause a really vulnerable um, melting pot that has actually contributed to the severity of the pandemic. And um, not only were we hearing from our alliances around the world, we've got um, national and regional alliances in over 65 countries, that they were experiencing enormous disruptions to care, to um, health services for people living with NCDs, but there were also implications for people who were developing COVID for longer chronic related um, implications and health implications for them. Not only that, but we're also seeing that response to the pandemic itself, so the lockdowns, et cetera, were actually uh, triggering different risk factors and increasing risk factor exposure for some people. And these things coming together helped us to start seeing a little bit of a trend amongst some of the industries that are implicated in NCDs and in particular particular around um, unhealthy food and drink, tobacco uh, and alcohol, fossil fuels, and the industries um, who are involved with these were also waking up to the impact the pandemic was having on their bottom lines. So we were hearing anecdotally through social media, all these alarm bells going off that um, while these behaviours, these tactics weren't necessarily unfamiliar to us and we'd been calling them out for a very long time, um, we, we were seeing the pandemic was providing fresh new opportunities for these industries to change the way they were behaving and um, and to concentrate their activities for, for sort of harmful, for, for pro promoting um, and getting positioning for their harmful products. So rather than letting those anecdotes disappear into the ether and social media outrage, we worked with the Spectrum Research Consortium um, to gather these examples. Um, the, our colleagues are based at, um, primarily at the University of Edinburgh, and we put a call out to the NCD community in particular, but also more widely, for people to share what they were seeing. 
And what we received back was phenomenal. So we, from over 94 countries, we received 760 examples. And around half of those were related to alcohol. Um, we also saw a lot around ultra-processed ultra food and drink, which is, is obviously quite visible as well and part of everybody's lives. But the alcohol um, examples were quite prolific and I'll share a few examples of those for you. Across the different industries, we saw similar strategies and tactics. So they were adapting their marketing and promotions and increasing availability. They were enhancing their corporate social responsibility activities. Um, they were do, undertaking activities that would shape policy environments, as, as has been heard a little bit earlier. And they were also pursuing partnerships um, and collaboration with all sorts, with governments, with civil society organisations, uh, with schools, with anywhere that they could position themselves for a benefit. So I'll share a bit of a snapshot. We don't have time to go into great detail, so please check out the report, Signalling Virtue, Promoting Harm. You can click through on hyperlinks throughout the report to see just some of the examples. And, um, and I'll show, as I said, I'll share a few now. So um, as you've already heard, you know, some of the brands were positioning themselves so that it'd be in your lounge room while you consumed your beer, or they were celebrating the heroes by relabeling their brands. They created um, face masks that put their brands on so that basically anybody wearing a face mask was a, a walking, talking billboard for the brand. Um, they position themselves as part of the solution, creating um, social distancing apps and, and gimmicks that would get a bit of PR spin. And the one that I felt particularly uncomfortable seeing came from Brazil with this um, inverted logo of the cast and beer brand looking like a pair of lungs, which everyone knows was quite vulnerable with, with the coronavirus. And the slogan they attached to that was, good beer is like air, you can't live without it. We also saw um, these brands, uh, as I said earlier, sort of increasing their partnerships and collaborations. So they jumped on the opportunities to be seen to be doing good. They claimed that suspending their, they were suspending their marketing spend, but then they'd divert all that into media relations um, for their CSR and their stunt activities, and they got a lot of uh, PR from that. Um, and a few more examples here is where some of those activities then linked into changing policies. So um, we certainly saw quite a lot of um, hand sanitizer shifting. So alcohol industry shifting into creating sanitizer was a big one. But not only that, they then would invite in the ministers of, um, for finance or health or otherwise to sort of be congratulated for their fabulous contributions to being part of the solution while lobbying for um, a diluted policy to ensure that lockdowns were, were easier on them or that um, takeaway was made available uh, and other dilution of policies that have been so long fought for, so hard won, um, and in a few months were instantly um, diluted and, and harmed and undermined. Um, in, in some cases, there were arguments to even continue on with these diluted policies beyond the pandemic, uh, which obviously is very concerning and something that we need to push back against. So what did we find? Um, what are the implications? We certainly feel that across all of these unhealthy industries that are contributing to poor health, we need global mechanisms that protect governments and policymaking from commercial and other vested interests um, and to manage those, the industry interference and influence. We need mechanisms to support governments and civil society and multilateral organisations to understand the risks of managing and of managing interactions with commercial sector actors. Um, in the pandemic or in any emergency crisis situation, any response, any support must be coherent with related health and development priorities. So that means including effectively tackling and preventing NCDs, not contributing to them. Um, and also the responses to the economic crisis and the funding constraints that we've seen also um, should be shaped by a commitment to build back better. So we need to be able to resist the industry pressure to adopt 
approaches to taxation or trade and regulation and availability that have been um, long proven to be damaging to health uh, and to development. And we can't allow the fox into the hen house um, at this time because that will continue to dilute and undermine incredibly important and evidence-based opportunities for improving and promoting people's health. So just to wrap up, we didn't want to stop at those first 760 examples. So the survey is open um, still. If you have seen any examples, not just what you're seeing through marketing, but also these examples where you can draw a link between the, the activities and lobbying and the policy change, we would love to hear about those. So please jump on the website and, um, and drop your details or the details in. Your submissions can be completely anonymous and we would really appreciate hearing them. Um, and uh, and that is all I will share for today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucy. Like this is very very well presented, and you could see it actually in the chat the people are reacting to some examples. And but I think now the recommendations are really important uh, for this webinar and then the, for the next steps. And that's why it's really great that we also have uh, two representatives from uh, two different governments with us and uh, who will now get the space to speak and, and talk about a little bit, looking a little bit also to the future. And I would like to also lift the uh, the question that was in the, in the chat from one of the participants who is also talking about like, okay, now, Hopefully, we are getting on the top of the pandemic, and uh, the societies are opening. And what can, but what can we do next, or what do we need to do next uh, about all these learnings and the knowledge that we have gained uh, during during the coronavirus crisis? So, with this, I am. I would like to invite then Dr. Mercy Karanja, who is a focal person in substance use management in the Ministry of Health, uh, Kenya. Please, uh, Dr. Karanja, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christina. Thank you for inviting me to this forum. Um, I'm really happy to participate and to listen in on everything. I, I do not have a series of slides that, like the people presented before me. I was just going to speak a little bit about our uh, experience uh, during this COVID time as a country and uh, perhaps what uh, we are moving towards in terms of policy regarding uh, the reduction of uh, the harmful use of alcohol. So like as spoken by most people earlier, the, the COVID-19 pandemic affected us in different ways here in the country. And one of the key things that uh, happened, of course, like it happened across the globe is a restriction of movement, uh, closure of entertainment, sports, bars, and restaurants, closure of social spaces, uh, and of course, closure of schools. And to some extent, we also had closure of uh, dr drug treatment facilities. And this meant a lot uh, of negative effects um, for our people. Uh, because of that, there was also, of course, the obvious increased stress uh, because of panic, uh, the pa pandemic to, to individuals and families. And hence, we had a lot of uptake and use of alcohol at home, which predisposed uh, school children and uh, minors to alcohol and substances. And there was a peculiar case to salvage the situation for those who are uh, having a problems with getting food, one of the politicians in the country actually distributed distributed um, uh, alcohol ag again alongside food rations for people. And the, the civil society organizations and the government and other players called on to him and told him, which was negative messaging around the, and some myths uh, towards that. Another thing that happened is um, because of the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, our police uh, who normally uh, at least manage uh, persons who are driving and drunk, they usually administer the breath tests to check whether somebody is, uh, is drinking and driving. But this could not, is no longer being used and this predisposed both to drunk driving and accidents, some of them which were fatal. We also saw a rise in uh, the number of cases of domestic violence, 
uh, which are also related to alcohol and substance use. So it, it, it really, there was a lot of harms that we have seen over the years. And when the, the, the bars and restaurants were opened, we found now there was another upsurge of people rushing to binge drink. So a lot of binge drinking also is happening now that the, the economy has partially been reopened. So these have been some of the harms that have been seen in our country. Kenya has some of the strictest laws in East Africa regarding alcohol uh, control, the regulation of sales, advertisements, and, and consumption. Uh, the challenge we've had over the years, most of the times, is uh, uh, when it comes to enforcement of those laws, we have the Alcohol Controls Act that restricts even the, 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 the advertising of alcohol, sales to minors, even bringing minors to bars and but you cannot restrict the, 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 the use of and the sale of alcohol, I mean, at home. So the, the enforcement is what has been lacking. We have seen that Kenya has a mental health policy. In our country, uh, alcohol and substance use management falls under the division of mental health where I work. And um, we have the Kenya mental health policy 2015-2030, which has actually now we have, uh, we're in the, progress, uh, an advanced stage of launching our Kenya Mental Health Action Plan, uh, which will see a lot of investment into the development of a national strategic uh, program in substance use management. Also, there is a lot of investment planning uh, on improvement of access to substance use treatment. We have also been in, embarking on capacity building and quality assurance on the preventive, curative, and promotive measures towards uh, prevention and management of alcohol use disorders. And of course, the integration of these programs at primary le uh, healthcare levels, as well as the social welfare systems. So the, the, we have also seen the uh, adoption of telemedicine and telepsychiatry and trying to reach out uh, persons who are affected by uh, substance use disorders and alcohol use. And our counselors and psychologists have been empowered to use this uh, avenue to reach more people, especially during these times when a lot of our rehabilitation centers have had to shut down because they lack the capacity to control the, the spread of COVID-19 amongst the, the, the clients who they admit into their facilities. So we are really taking up the use of telemedicine and telepsychology and counseling services for, uh, to, to offer um, treatment and uh, services. So now we, we have the National Technical Working Group, and I know we invited Movendi in our last meeting to join us because we are looking at how we're going to develop a national strategy uh, on the control of uh, and prevention of alcohol. So we are uh, in a good stage right now with the support also of WHO, and we are hoping that we can, uh, you know, harness the the interventions and, and participation of stakeholders to provide uh, for us uh, maybe technical support, uh, maybe other resources that we may need on the uh, prevention of alcohol use. And of course, to keep the government accountable in the implementation and enforcement of the laws that are there, we need the civil society organization to keep the government in check as well. Then, of course, um, uh, finally, we also uh, realize and recognize that this is going to need a multi-sectoral approach. And the lessons that we have learned uh, from COVID-19 pandemic are going to be very helpful in uh, revising our strategic approach towards this uh, problem. And of course, making sure that it's more uh, involving and it's sustainable so that it's not a one-off thing. Uh, like I've seen in the comment session that, yes, we are addressing the issues when COVID-19 is here, but what about after COVID-19 when before the economy is fully reopened, as we've seen before, there are even more problems that are arising when reopened because of the rush to uh, what we call normalcy. So thank you very much. And uh, with those few remarks, I want to thank you.
Thank you very much. Now you froze, so maybe I jumped into your last uh, sentence. But uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Karanja, for sharing the also the experience that you had, but also looking a little bit uh, into the future and what, what your plans are. And now I would like to invite um, Dr. Rohan Ratnayake, and uh, he is a director of, in the Directorate of Mental Health in the Ministry of Health in Sri Lanka, to share with us actually in the very similar way about Sri Lanka then. Thank you. You will need to unmute. Can you hear me? We do, yes. Can you hear me? Ah, yes. Person. So we all know that alcohol-related harm is a serious health and social issue. And it's an impediment to the uh, human development. Uh, the estimated present value of uh, economic cost of the alcohol-related conditions for Sri Lanka in 2015 was... Uh, 886 US dollars, uh, US, uh, yeah, US dollars, million, uh, 886. This is 1.1% 1 .1 of our GDP for that year. So during COVID epidemic, uh, the, there has been uh, several, uh, several uh, the studies done, but a small qualitative study uh, has shown that Lockdown has increased illicit brewing, including home brewing of uh, spirits. Uh, this has led to uh, increased use of illicit alcohol. Uh, illegally delivered alcohol has also been readily available in the community. Most of regular drinkers had reduced the, the frequency of consumption, and some of them were abstained from alcohol for varying lengths of periods. Non-availability, accessi non, non -availability, accessibility issues, lack, lack of affordability due to losing of regular income are contributory factors. However, almost all of them were returned back, returned back to the consumption earlier consumption level when the pandemic limitations were over. A, country stud, uh, a countrywide study done by uh, Alcohol and Drug Information Center, ADIC, shows that 80% of participants have reduced the consumption and 30% of them are willing to, were willing to maintain this status. Uh, those studies, and importantly, the empirical evidence and uh, personal communications from uh, the, 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 uh, the consultants uh, clearly show the need for more law enforcement and the capacity development of grassroots level healthcare workers and community at large to sustain the changes. These changes are not confined to lockdown, but aggravated in lockdown. And these are the normal behaviors in day-to-day -day life, which are good entry points. Are we geared to grab this opportunity? Is a, is a question. Delivery, delivery of alcohol to doorsteps is a bad trend, which might extend to even other illegal as well as legal drugs, which people are addicted to and might become an income source to some of them. Then there is a uh, there is an imminent risk for uh, sustaining this trend even in the absence of pandemic. Sri Lanka has a very comprehensive alcohol policy, I I should say, and even uh, relevant laws. Sri Lankan policy covers the priority areas of marketing, pricing, and trade limiting availability and accessibility, drink driving, community action, and surveillance monitoring and evaluation. Community-based alcohol prevention and control programs, ban on advertising, and drink driving policy are our, are our successful stories. 
among others. Alcohol rehabilitation centers have been established covering at least one for each province in the country. Alcohol control policy is a success due to the understanding of the people. State mediated committees working towards alcohol prevention are in place covering every administrative region. However, sustaining the activities has become a major issue. This is not specific to alcohol alone, and this is common to other fields as well. However, as has been experienced in other parts of the world, social media, which have involved in promoting alcohol consumption, are difficult to contain. New strategies to curb the, this trend and mechanisms to counteract the company tactics have to be taught to persons involved in alcohol prevention. So we need assistance from veterans. We have plans to formulate taxation. We have plans to formulate taxation policy for the government within this year, and also to strengthen, uh, uh, strengthen and initiate community-based rehabilitation. More and more training has been planned. And we have already uh, trained uh, medical officers during COVID, uh, uh, during COVID uh, epidemic, uh, pandemic. So we, are all, we are always willing to liaise with any civil or international organizations working in good in intention towards prevention and good practices in alcohol control. Chairperson, this concludes my presentation. Thank you once again. Thank you very, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Ratnayake. And then uh, I will just, because now we are running out of time, so I will really very fast go to Michele uh, from OECD, who would share the latest report that was just launched last week and is actually answering on some uh, questions that we had, like what is happening with alcohol? Do people use more or less and which groups and such? So I will give you the floor, Michele. Uh, yeah, the floor is yours. Go ahead, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this invitation. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to, to be here with you. Let me skip through the uh, few slides that I've put together, and in particular on uh, the recent work that OECD has uh, finalized and launched uh, uh, a little bit more than a week ago on the effect of COVID-19 on alcohol consumption and policies responses. Um, the first slide uh, is really to summarize many of the same messages uh, that um, other speakers before me uh, discussed, in particular colleagues from WHO and, uh, and PAO. Uh, also, our analysis find uh, that there has been an impact uh, of COVID-19 on drinking behaviors and patterns and also correlated harm in OECD countries. Uh, so uh, the data that uh, uh, we put together, we collected, uh, uh, would suggest uh, that the volume of consumption was slightly increased. Most people did not change their drinking about, but among those that did, a larger proportion increased consumption. And the fact that there may have been a small increase in consumption would be also testified by alcohol duty receipts, uh, which is essentially the data that countries collect uh, uh, in terms of, uh, of income, uh, of revenues that come from taxation of alcohol. And at least in Germany, uh, United Kingdom uh, and United States, uh, there has been a 3-5% increase in 2020 compared to uh, 2019 of uh, uh, duties collected uh, uh, for alcohol. Whether uh, this is for uh, an increase in consumption or whether uh, uh, this is stockpiling, uh, I think that uh, uh, we'll, we'll get to know only in the, in the future. Uh, the frequency of consumption increased too. In, uh, in the 11 countries, uh, mainly OECD countries, that we looked at, 43% uh, uh, of respondents uh, reported an increase in drinking uh, compared to 25% of people that uh, reported a uh, decrease in, in drinking, in frequency of drinking. Uh, but overall, binge drinking remained uh, fairly constant. 
there was a, a huge shift in the place of consumption, unsurprising. Hospitality sectors, hotels, bars, the restaurants were severely hit by the policies that were put in place uh, uh, to uh, prevent the spread of the virus. At the same time, uh, uh, retail stores uh, and e-commerce in particular saw a huge increase in sales. For example, in the United States, uh, at the beginning of 2020, there was a 234% uh, increase compared to 2019 in, in online purchases. As it often happens uh, with uh, harmful alcohol consumption, uh, uh, some groups uh, are of particular interest and are those that are hit the most uh, by, uh, by this risk factor uh, to public health. Uh, in particular, literature would suggest that women, parents of young children, people with higher income, individuals depressed when dunks are high symptoms, report the high, highest increase in alcohol consumption. Then we'll also look the, at the data on uh, uh, some of uh, uh, the uh, measurable uh, events uh, that are uh, often associated uh, with harmful patterns of alcohol consumption, in particular uh, statistics on domestic violence uh, uh, that show an increase in many OECD countries. For example, across European countries, there was been a 60% rise in emergency call uh, due to domestic violence. Our analysis go beyond this and look at the impact of drinking uh, um, alcohol. In particular, we look at two scenarios, one on uh, all alcohol drink and one on one and 1.5 drinks per day for respectively women and men. And we look at the impact of uh, these patterns of alcohol consumption on population health and the economy. Uh, the graph that, uh, uh, that I'm showing here uh, shows you the result for the 52 countries that we include in our analysis, including all OECD countries. Uh, on uh, OECD European countries, uh, uh, G20 countries, and other partners of the, of the OECD. And the, the, it shows you the impact on life expectancy and healthy life expectancy. Now, if you look at, for example, OECD countries, uh, we can uh, uh, see that uh, over the next 30 years, uh, up to 2050, the life expectancy of uh, uh, people in the OECD will be reduced by one year uh, due to the diseases uh, and medical conditions uh, caused uh, by drinking more than 1 and 1.5 drinks per day. Uh, what is uh, even more interesting is that the impact on healthy life expectancy, so uh, the life expectancy adjusting for the quality of life, uh, is even uh, larger, uh, suggesting uh, that uh, harmful patterns of alcohol consumption have an even uh, higher impact on, uh, on the quality of life uh, rather than on the disease. Then you know probably the OECD for our economic assessment. And uh, uh, clearly, we also looked, and there was a, a big focus of our analysis on the impact of these diseases on healthcare expenditure. For example, in G20 countries, we calculated that 1.7% of the healthcare budget is uh, devoted, is attributable uh, to conditions uh, caused by drinking above this threshold. 1.4% of GDP is reduced uh, by uh, these uh, uh, diseases. Uh, if you look at children, uh, costs for children and the next generation may be also significant. In particular, we looked at, uh, at the countries, uh, mainly European countries, although there was uh, uh, one uh, North American country, and we saw that uh, uh, children that uh, who never experienced uh, drunkness uh, are 30% more likely to perform well at school compared to similar children that have been uh, drunk. And finally, alcohol consumption and its associated diseases have uh, uh, an impact uh, on, uh, on the pockets uh, of the population, uh, even beyond uh, those that uh, uh, have uh, harmful patterns of alcohol consumption, because uh, treating all the consequences of uh, harmful patterns of alcohol consumption cost the equivalent of 135 US dollar per capita per year in uh, uh, G20 countries. And uh, clearly this is, if you want an alcohol tax uh, that is levied every year, on uh, uh, all the population. We look also at, uh, at the policies in place in countries, and uh, uh, in particular, we look at the WHO data. For example, the data that the PAO colleague showed at the beginning of this, tour, this, uh, this uh, workshop, uh, and also the evidence in the literature. And we have identified a number of gaps in policy action 
Uh, and uh, uh, some of the, the, the key gaps uh, uh, that we have identified is uh, the uh, relatively small number of uh, the 52 countries uh, that we are considering uh, that have a written national policy and the national plans in place. Uh, a little bit more than one third of these countries have a uh, uh, the whole uh, framework in place to couple arms for alcohol consumption. 74% uh, of countries do not automatically adjust alcohol taxes for inflation, uh, leaving uh, the, the uh, gap uh, for alcohol to become more affordable over time if uh, the taxation is not adjusted. The majority of uh, countries does not have the most effective regulation of their pricing in place, and this become even more uh, uh, worrisome in the case of social media, uh, which uh, have seen a large increase in, in news, uh, particularly by younger generations during the COVID pandemic. Finally, in Europe and the United States, uh, these are the regions for which we have data, less than 10% of those potentially benefiting from screening and brief intervention in primary care are covered by uh, this intervention. These are some of the major gaps. In response to this gap, uh, we analyze uh, different policies, packages of policies that countries can put in place. And we found that a PPP approach is an, an excellent investment and addresses many of the current policy gaps in countries. In particular, our analysis suggests that uh, a package uh, including policy enforcement to limit alcohol-related injuries and violence, protecting children from alcohol promotion, primary care to help patients with harmful drinking of patterns, and pricing policies to limit the affordability of cheap alcohol if is upscaled in the 48 countries over the next 30 years. Uh, this could prevent 8.5 million of cases of alcohol-related condition avoided per year. Uh, the healthcare budget uh, uh, would be lowered by about 28 billion US dollar every year uh, due to reduced healthcare expenditure. And uh, this looks a very big number, but to give you a little bit of context, this is equivalent for the, uh, uh, about equivalent to the healthcare budget of Israel, for example. Uh, we can also restart the economy uh, more quickly and better uh, because uh, uh, the reduction in diseases caused by alcohol consumption will make up, uh, available the equivalent of 3.9 million additional full-time workers per year uh, and, uh, and will increase the productivity. Finally, this is an excellent investment for countries. We calculated that every dollar invested uh, in this policy package would return in, in economic benefit uh, about 16 US dollar uh, if we exclude any impact on alcohol. I stop here. I thank you very much for your attention. Let me just remind you that uh, uh, we are very happy uh, to make available the report and there is a ready you can find on our website, uh, in particular analysis uh, uh, for any country among those 52 that we have included and it can be uh, downloaded from our website. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Michele. And I can just also add that uh, you had a great conversation with uh, our Director of Strategy and Advocacy, Mike Dumbir, and it's now also published as a podcast. So everyone who would like to hear more and like really not only how it was, but a little bit of the thinking around different findings, uh, it's available. So um, thank you for the conversation, but mostly thank you for and the presentation, but mostly thank you for the report as well. Um, I would like to invite all the speakers here now. Now we are wrapping up uh, actually. And uh, if those who are still uh, here, if you turn on your video so I can find you and spotlight you uh, because I would like to ask just like really in a few seconds if you would like to lift something that you have taken from today's conversation what uh, well, yeah what is it some kind of learning or insight that you have and uh, now I'm searching for Maristella who I believe is still here and I would give you the floor. You have started, and <laughs> now I give you the floor. There you are. Uh, and you are muted, Maristella. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I think all the presentations uh, coincided on uh, key issues that are important for alcohol policy and uh, need to be taken seriously at, at a very high level of political commitment. I'm sorry. 
Now it's muted. Okay. Yeah. That was that. Then the, the argument. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, please try again. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, so that is that uh, alcohol policies are at risk, and that means the health of uh, all people are at risk. Uh, we uh, do not even talk about long term effects of what's happening now, and this will continue to impact uh, on alcohol related harms. And just one example is on uh, fe fetal alcohol spectrum disorders as a result of pregnancies while drinking during the pandemic that will take years to identify and deal with. Uh, so I think we have uh, uh, very strong players around the world here, regional offices and uh, the OC uh, OECD that can join forces and advocate to uh, lift uh, alcohol as a public health threat and that we need to do more and be more visible and uh, turn around uh, the trends. They're very worrisome. The results will not be good if we don't do anything. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, uh, final remarks. And I would give the floor to, I understand that no one from the European office is uh, here. Uh, then uh, Per from IOGT NTO Sweden. Final remarks, I, I think I can only repeat what I said that or what the report I, I told about said that alcohol has a, a big impact on the pandemic and that there, there is a, by reducing alcohol consumption and by using the alcohol policies we know that are effective, we can um, improve the health and improve the situation for the society, both healthcare and, and the economic society. So that's uh, uh, a, a great opportunity we have. Yeah, thank you a lot, Per. And as you said, also the several reports now also uh, really show it and we could see Unfortunately, life experiments from several countries that has shown that, for example, South Africa. So thank you very much, Per. And then I will move to the next speaker we had with us, and that would be Lucy. Thanks, Christina. What a great session. Thank you for everybody, all the other speakers. It was really engaging. Um, I guess my main message is, gosh, the alcohol industry, even listening to the other speakers, is one that will stop at nothing to position their brands and their products as essential parts of our communities, of our cultures, and as solutions to the pandemic. And they are not. They are part of this problem. They are part of so many other problems. And governments must beware. And they must put public health priorities ahead of the profit interests of these industries. Thank you very much. And then this takes me to the government. So I would like to give the floor to Dr. Karanja. Uh, what would be your final remark? If you are there, let us see. No, then I would pass the floor uh, then to Dr. Um, Ratnayake, please. Yeah, thank you. The, the, the same feeling I got today so when when we work uh, at the local level right so, so when we start working on alcohol so we feel isolated and we feel we are a minority but while working is going on uh, there are a lot of people to work with us to give hands to help us like that Today, I feel that we are not isolated and we are not a minority, we are, a, we are the majority. So, so we have a lot of people to work with and to help each other. Thank you. Thank you this very is much. Apart, this is apart from the technical stuff I work, right? Yeah, okay. yeah. Thank you very much. And then uh, uh, the last final remark would be uh, from Michele Cicchini from OECD. OECD. 
Thank you very much also for giving me the last word, essentially. Uh, I would speak again to, to the economic message. Uh, we all know uh, that alcohol has a significant public health impact, uh, but uh, uh, it's also, um, it also causes significant costs, uh, very high costs for the persons uh, that have uh, uh, problematic patterns of alcohol consumption, for those near them, uh, but also more in general for the world society. Uh, tackling alcohol consumption uh, improves the population health, but it's also a good investment for countries. I would say even an excellent investment for countries, uh, because for every dollar invested, uh, countries get back uh, $16 uh, dollars, uh, due to um, uh, improved uh, uh, economy. Um, it's, uh, it's really simply the case to invest in these policies, which are not uh, technically difficult to implement. Yeah, thank you very much to all of you. You have actually, when we put together all your final remarks, it's a, it's a great uh, wrap up. So we can see that the, the alcohol harm and the burden has existed before COVID-19 pandemic, but it just really accelerated it or, or put it under the spotlight and we could see it. Uh, uh, and also we could see how alcohol policies could actually help us to prevent it. And as also Maria from the WHO Europe said that it's not only about health, but it's actually also about uh, the development of, soci uh, of society at large, not, on not only uh, economic, but it's, uh, as you said, uh, Michele, that uh, it's a huge part of it as well. So I would say that this would be a conclusion and that we have tools uh, at hand, and now it's really up to the governments how they will react after the, um, after the pandemic, when the life goes back to normal. We hope that the normal will be better than the normal that was uh, before. So thank you very much. I would like to thank all the speakers for being with us. This was a long event. So thank you for staying also uh, throughout. And uh, thank you for all the participants who have joined us. I hope you have gotten your answers in the chat. And if you have still some answers, please contact us and we will connect you with the speakers or provide some answers. So thank you a lot and enjoy the rest of the week.